Greetings and welcome to the Chemistry 222 lecture for chapter 9, which is going to look deeper into the gas laws. And this is kind of a cool chapter for chemistry because uh, as chemistry came out of what I consider to be the dark ages, which was alchemy and stuff like that, um, that chemistry kind of became a true science by studying gases. And that kind of always blows my mind because like if you were sitting next to me and I said, hey, look at my gas and I opened my hand or something, right, the gas would totally totally like go out of my hand and go into the universe and you wouldn't know anything about it. So gases are very hard to control, but the study of gases is arguably like where chemistry got its start. And that's kind of a cool thing. So this is a beginning of a couple of chapters now when we're going to start looking at states of matter. We're going to look at gases in this section. We'll look at liquids and solids in the next section. And then after that, we'll look at solutions. Now, because we're going to be studying gas, gases which have quantities like mass or volume or pressure or stuff like that, we will start looking again more at math. All right, we're going to have measurable quantities. And math means, of course, we'll be back in the significant figures world. So make sure that you're up to speed with your sig figs and stuff. And we'll go through some examples to remind you. Oh, joy. So anyway, without further ado, let's get into this section. A very practical and useful uh, uh, value that we can get from gases, besides, of course, breathing, which is critical, is an airbag, all right? And airbags, of course, prevent lots and lots of bad accidents and stuff uh, every day, probably. Uh, my own sister was involved in a wreck, and an airbag, I think, probably saved her life, and she just basically walked away unscathed, which was kind of cool. An airbag works by essentially having a flood of nitrogen in a closed area, and and the airbag then comes up and kind of protects the person from it. The nitrogen is created by a decomposition reaction with sodium azide, NaN3, and that's a real unstable little molecule. But anyway, if it's uh, basically startled, it breaks down quickly into sodium, but most importantly for this problem, the nitrogen gas, and quite a bit of nitrogen gas too, and that's what makes the balloon expand. And yes, definitely there are problems of uh, airbags like hurting people. Uh, hopefully when the airbag was deployed, that kind of damage was less than the wreck of the car and stuff, but I don't know, that's a whole nother topic, obviously, of uh, discussion. In a collision involving a car equipped with airbags, the impact initiates a chemical reaction. Automobile airbags work when a sample of sodium azide detonates, producing nitrogen gas. This gas fills the bag. Using our understanding of the gas laws, we can calculate the quantity of sodium azide required to produce the appropriate amount of nitrogen gas. To make an airbag function, you must understand how gases work, and that's what we're going to look in this section. And again, a lot of these rules uh, started at the beginning of uh, arguable modern, modern chemistry, so it's kind of fun to think about that too. According to the kinetic molecular theory, the molecules of a solid are locked in place though they have motion. Molecules of a liquid are closely associated with each other, but move relative to one another. Molecules of a gas move independently and occupy a much larger volume than those of a corresponding liquid or solid. There are three main states of matter, and uh, they're probably all familiar to you, which are solid, liquid, and gas. And the kinetic molecular theory of matter, the KMT, is what scientists use to describe and understand the behavior. So in the animation we just saw in the lower left, all those little blue dots are some kind of a molecule or element. So let's pretend, for example, that all the blue dots are water molecules. So solid water would be ice, which of course you put in your drinks. Liquid water would be the middle part, and that's of course what we drink. And then gaseous water would be steam, like if you're making a cup of tea or something like that. Now it's important to realize that all of those are water molecules. They're all H2O. So the chemical composition of water has not changed going from ice to liquid water, liquid water to steam, and vice versa. What has changed is the relationship of the water molecules to each other. 
other. So in a solid, they're really close to each other, very, very tight. And in a liquid, as you can see, there's, um, there's a connection between the molecules, but it's more flexible. I'd want to say liquid, but that doesn't probably sound right. And then finally, in the gas and stuff, there's just like all over the place. Um, another silly example of that is on the right hand side. I found these uh, pictures of sheep. And I don't know where this came from. But anyway, if the sheep are like spread out eating, that's kind of like a gas. All right. The sheep are kind of independent. But you can see in the midi middle video that the sheep there are trying to get through a little uh, hole in the fence. That would be like a liquid. All right. All the molecules kind of congeal together and go through slowly. And then a solid would be if they're all very tight to each other, uh, being it. They're all sheep, all right, just different orientations. Uh, if neither of those examples work, then look at the cool picture in the upper left corner. Uh, that was taken somewhere around Olympia, apparently. It shows the liquid water, the, the water that the boat is on. The water, a sailboat, is being pulled along by a wind, which would be the steam. And then in the mountains there, you can see some snow on the Olympics. That would be, of course, one of the solid states of matter. But again, all the same substance, just the relationship between those molecules has changed. And you can see some of the differences then between solid liquid gas, either through water or if you want through the sheep, it's your call. When it comes to gases, there's a lot of free space in a gas, all right? And if you uh, look up from this video right now and look out the window, all right, you should be able to see a ways anyway. You're looking through a gas, all right? All around us on the earth all the time, there's the atmosphere. 20% uh, or so oxygen, most of it's nitrogen, a little water and argon, but you're seeing through it, all right? You can't really see through a piece of copper, all right? That doesn't work out too well and it's difficult to look through a liquid like water, although not impossible. So gases, though, you can see through them usually pretty readily. There's a lot of free space. Um, gases can be expanded infinitely. So earlier I was babbling about showing you a gas, and, and so let's pretend that I had a gas in my hand somehow, and I could keep it there, which is probably silly. But anyway, I open my hand, and whoosh, the gas will expand, and it will expand into the area of the room I'm in. If I'm outside, the gas Gas just keeps going until there's basically nothing there. So gases will occupy containers uniformly and completely, all right? And it may take a little while if it's a big room or something like that, but eventually the density, if you will, of the gas molecules per unit volume would be probably comparable. And another interesting thing is that gases do diffuse and mix rapidly with each other. So nitrogen and oxygen get along really well in our atmosphere. They mix very well. And most of the time with gases, you can have that happen. Now, of course, if the gases react with each other, that's not going to be as probable. But nitrogen and oxygen are both pretty stable with each other, so it's no problem. If you're going to start thinking about the properties of gases, you've got to use some math. So unlike the last several chapters, we are back in the world of math. We're going to measure quantities of gas. And of course, that's when the math part comes in. So when it comes to the properties of gas, we have to think about, for example, what volume of gas we're using. And volume in gases is usually measured in liters. All right. And just as a quick reminder, there are a thousand milliliters in a liter. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll measure something in milliliters, but then when we put it into our modeling programs or modeling uh, equations, we're going to use volume in liters. So a thousand milliliters per liter. We're definitely going to need temperature because uh, temperature of gases is a big factor. Higher temperatures, more action. The gases are more active and low temperatures, they're not. Now, models of gases usually use Kelvin. All right. Kelvin is uh, absolute zero is where all matter stops. However, a lot of times in the lab, you'll measure temperature in Celsius and then have to convert to Kelvin or maybe back to Celsius later. So remembering that Kelvin temperature uh, are never ever negative, then you would take your Celsius temperature and add 273.15 to it to get the Kelvin temperature. This is stuff we did back in Chem 221, which I know seems forever ago, but we're going to start doing it again. So the 273.15 isn't going to be an important number. You add it to Celsius uh, to get Kelvin, you subtract from Kelvin to get Celsius. 
the amount of gas will be important. If you have just a little bit of gas, it's no big deal. But in high enough concentrations, gases can have all kinds of problems, asphyxiation and stuff like that being some of the worst ones. So usually when people think of the amount of gas, they'll use moles. We're going to start using the symbol N, little N right there, to represent moles. All right. Now, sometimes in the lab, we'll measure grams of a gas and we'll have to turn to moles. And that's where the molar mass of a gas is important. We talked about uh, molar mass and moles in Chem 221. The molar mass is the number you get from the periodic table. So for example, helium is about four grams per mole. If you look on the periodic table, its atomic number is two. It has two protons, but the molar mass of the gas is about four grams per mole. The new player on the block for gases is the pressure. And pressure is something that's almost exclusive to just gases. Um, pressure in chemistry, in, when it comes to models, is usually uh, the unit that's used is the atmosphere. And atmosphere gets the symbol ATM. Now there's different ways to measure pressure in the lab. And those ways usually have to be converted into atmospheres. So we'll talk about ways to go from the other kinds of pressure units to atmospheres here in a little bit. So we're going to build up to kind of the best equation, if you will, for a gas. And when we use that equation, we our volumes need to be in liters. Temperatures have to be in Kelvin. Uh, moles are the amount they have to be used. And then pressure will be in atmospheres. So pressure is kind of interesting. Pressure has actually uh, been around for a long time. Torricelli in 1643. I mean, wow, that's a long time ago before the United States. Anyway, Torricelli in 1643 developed the barometer. And a barometer is a measure as a way to measure pressure. And you can see in the picture on the right, um, all around us all the time is uh, the pressure of the atmosphere. And it is a pressure. It pushes down on us. All right. So what Torricelli did is he made a narrow column of mercury there in the middle. And as the pressure pushed the mercury up the column, the mass of gravity wants to come back down. All right, gravity is always pulling things down. So the atmospheric pressure is essentially canceled by the gravity of the mercury pulling down. And the length of mercury there, which is literally a length, usually in millimeters mercury, but you could use inches and stuff, um, that is the pressure. All right, it's literally the length length that the mercury goes up that column. And you have to calibrate it and stuff like that, so it's a little weird. But anyway, the pressure of the area around you, the atmospheric pressure, does change, all right? And generally at the ocean, the atmosphere is about 760 millimeters of mercury. That's called a standard atmosphere. We'll see that in a little bit. But um, as you get higher in elevation, then generally the pressure goes down. And we'll talk about this more in a little bit. There are, of course, electronic ways now to measure pressure. At Mount Hood Community College, in the actual face-to-face -face labs, we will use an electronic barometer, but we do have some old-school mercury thermometers as well. So when it comes to pressure units, a standard atmosphere is like the standard pressure. And supposedly at the ocean, that's what most of the time you'd experience. That's kind of a vague thing and stuff, but that's the idea behind what an atmosphere is. An atmosphere is equal to many different kinds of units. The one that we'll use uh, quite a bit is that an atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. So on the picture on the right, that literally is the height of the mercury in the column, all right? So if your column is 760 millimeters of mercury, that equals an atmosphere. Um, in centimeters, that would be 76 centimeters. There are 10 millimeters per centimeter. So if you ever see centimeters, you can then quickly equate that over. But there's more than just millimeters and centimeters of mercury. A tor is another term for a millimeter of mercury. Tor is named, of course, after Torricelli. So tor, 760 tor, also equals one atmosphere. And again, a tor and a millimeter of mercury are the same. Now, in the face-to-face -face lab, we would have used or will use what's called a millibar. And a bar is close to an atmosphere, but not quite the same. 1.013 bars 
millibars equals an atmosphere. In the lab, our, our millibars, um, there are a thousand millibars per bar. So when you convert that over, that's 1,013 millibars per atmosphere. So if you are doing this lab face to face, uh, 1,013 millibars per atmosphere is what we'll use uh, in the lab to do calculations. A lot of times on local weather channels, they'll talk about pressure, and, but they won't talk about it in atmospheres or centimeters of mercury or anything like that. They will a lot of times use inches and they'll use different kind of uh, measurements and stuff like that. Um, that's totally fine. Uh, of course, I try to stay away from inches and stuff in science in these classes, but it's all right. Um, Notice that everything so far has been based on mercury, all right? Mercury is a very dense liquid, all right? It's about, I think, 13.6 or so grams per centimeter cube. You can have a barometer with water, all right? But the problem is, is that atmospheric pressure pushes the water up a lot more. So if you're going to have a barometer made of water, you're going to have to have a column, which is basically about more than 34 feet high, all right, because you have to have some fluctuation for things. Um, when I was at Dartmouth, they had one of these. It was in a big open area with an elevator, essentially. And here was this super long column. And the advantage of it is you can get really accurate values. I mean, uh, when you have 34 feet to deal with, then small fluctuations show up readily, unlike Mercury, where the uh, changes would be more subtle. But on the other hand, having, you know, a 34 plus foot column isn't exactly real practical in the regular lab, so just FYI. The SI unit of pressure, and again, as a quick reminder, SI is like the standard units that scientists usually like to use. But anyway, the SI unit is called the Pascal, and it gets the symbol capital P little a. And a Pascal, uh, it can be converted from atmospheres. Uh, there's 101.325 kilopascals in an atmosphere, all right? And so in uh, physics, uh, a lot of times they'll use the pascal instead of atmospheres, millimeters of mercury, tor, stuff like that, which is fine. You can convert your pressures over to pascals, um, kilopascals, or <laughs> hectopascals, which is down there. Um, that's totally fine. Uh, on the other hand, in chemistry, we're going to use the other ones more. So in physics, you'll probably see some pascals, but here here in chemistry, what we're going to see a lot of, we're going to see a lot of the atmosphere, we're going to see a lot of the millimeters of mercury, which is equal to Tor, and then once in a while, especially if we have face-to-face -face lab, 113 or 1,013 millibars per atmosphere will also be important as well. But again, you can convert any of these over to pascals, inches of mercury, 34 feet of water, whatever you want to do, no problem. Nitrogen gas has a pressure of 452 millimeters of mercury. Let's express this pressure in atmospheres. Okay, no problem. So uh, this is an example of a kind of calculation you'll do. We need to convert this millimeter of mercury value into an atmosphere. And you can see there right above the little question, it says 760 millimeters of mercury per atmosphere. That is considered an exact conversion. So the seven 60 and the one atmosphere, we don't worry about the sig figs there. So when this problem, when you take 452 millimeters and you convert it over, you'll need to have a three sig fig answer and uh, no problem. So mathematically, you would go 452 divided by 760. If you do that, it comes out to be 0.595 atmospheres. So that's the atmosphere value for 452 millimeters of mercury. No problem. Pressure, like I said earlier, is about one atmosphere at sea level. So if you go to Seaside or Lincoln City, something like that, the pressure is usually about one atmosphere. But look, weather changes will make this um, go up and down a little bit. If you're about ready to hit a storm, the pressure will change quite a bit. Um, as elevation increases, your pressure decreases. All right. And again, I like to think about how gravity is basically pulling them down. And the higher up you get, the less 
atmosphere you have. So Gresham, Oregon, the elevation at City Hall is supposedly about 301 feet. So usually at Gresham, Oregon and at Mount Hood Community College, the pressure is usually less than one atmosphere. All right. Um, I've done a lab that's measured pressure now for several years, and I'm always surprised how sometimes just day to day, the pressure will change kind of uh, quite a bit. And again, most of the time it is under one atmosphere, but once in a while we've had storm fronts come through and the atmospheres will jump to more than one atmosphere, which is kind of interesting. Um, you can see the different pressures you would experience at Denver, which is about a mile high, La Paz, Bolivia, even higher yet. And of course, at the top of Mount Everest, much less than one atmosphere. If you've watched uh, documentaries, people climbing Mount Everest, they often need oxygen, uh, except for the super tough people who my hat's off big time, but I digress. Anyway, yeah, very, very thin atmosphere, much harder to breathe. So the first of the laws we're going to look at was created by a guy named Boyle. And again, look at the dates he was around, 1627 to 1691. And at this time, chemistry was more of a study, I would argue, of alchemy, where they were essentially trying to turn things into gold and find ultimate solvents and stuff like that. It was early chemistry, but not quite as formal. But Boyle realized that there's a relationship between the pressure of a gas and the volume of a gas. And so Boyle's law says that if the moles N and the temperature T are constant, then pressure times volume always equals a constant. Uh, I'll talk about why NRT is there in a little bit. Don't worry about that right now. But pressure times volume is always equal to a constant. So what this means is that pressure, as it, if pressure increases all of a sudden, your volume then will decrease. Or if the pressure goes down, then all of a sudden the volume will go up. So mathematically, we write this as P1 V1 equals P2 V2. So the pressure of the gas times the volume of the gas in some initial state one equals the pressure of the gas times the volume of the gas in some final state two. And as long as P, uh, both P's are in the same kind of unit and V's are in the same kind of unit, you can use just about any kind of unit you want here. Pressure and volume are inversely related. Weight on the plunger of a sealed syringe increases the pressure on the air in the syringe. The air cannot escape, but its volume reduces under the pressure. Mathematically, uh, when P times V equals K, that means that pressure is inversely proportional to volume or vice versa. So the lower left-hand graph shows what happens if you try and plot volume versus pressure. You don't get a nice straight line. And that means that volume times pressure wouldn't be very, uh, or volume uh, is, is, is not directly proportional to pressure, I should say. However, in the lower right-hand corner, you can see a graph of volume versus 1 over P. And then you do have a nice linear relationship. And if you have a linear relationship, that's when you can use cool equations that uh, make sense in this level of chemistry. So in the video then that showed kind of middle center there, all right, uh, they're basically adding mass, all right, and mass of lead is a kind of like a way to add pressure, all right, because the lead is pushing down more lead, more pressure. And they're plotting one over volume versus essentially the pressure and they get a nice straight line. So if all of that was kind of gobbledygook, just realize that pressure times volume is always going to equal a constant. And so scientists can use P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2 pretty handy. Charles is another person a little later than Boyle. You can see the dates there that he was alive. Charles was quite the balloonist. At the time, balloons were a big thing. They used to uh, take a long time to make enough gas for a balloon. They would then float the balloon from one city to the next. The city they left, they were like, oh, good luck. Good morning. Have a good voyage. And in the other city where, of course, they didn't have the internet at the time, people were like, what the heck? And they were like burned. Uh, stat anyway, the, so the tradition to have a uh, 
bottle of champagne for the owner of the land you you drop into is uh, basically from this area because it made the people happier when this weird balloon crashed on their crops. But anyway, I digress. Charles Law says that if the moles of gas are constant and the pressure of the gas is constant, then volume of the gas equals a constant K times T. And if you rewrite this a little bit where you have an initial set of conditions equals a final set of conditions, you can first divide both of those equations by T. You get V over T equals K or what you can rewrite it, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. All right. And this is considered to be Charles law. It relates the volume of a gas to the temperature of a gas. And again, it works really well, but you have to have pressure constant and the amount of gas constant moles as well. Temperature and volume are directly related. As heat is added to a sealed syringe, the volume of the air in the syringe increases. A plot of gas temperature and volume demonstrates that the relationship between them is linear. If we extrapolate the line down to a temperature of absolute zero, in principle, the gas has no volume. In the first part of that video, they heated a syringe, and the syringe basically had a gas in it. And as the temperature went up, all right, then the volume increased. It pushed it out. Uh, conversely, if you cooled it down, then the gas volume would decrease as well. So V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2 works really well. However, there is a problem with this law, and it happens at absolute zero. Now, first of all, absolute zero is is the kind of almost magical place in science where supposedly all matter stops. But mathematically, right, you can't uh, have a zero value um, in your calculations. So if you go down to zero Kelvin, you can see there from the graph, it looks like you would go to zero volume. And all matter has volume of some sort. Even the nucleus would have a little bit of volume to it. So what that graph is showing is that I'm going to talk about these gas laws as being so cool. <laughs> and they are cool, all right? However, they're mostly, quote unquote, cool uh, at certain temperatures and pressures. There's going to be some places where the gas law breaks down. And zero Kelvin is certainly one of the values where the gas laws will break down. Um, another thing I'd like to point out is that if you look at that equation, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, you must use Kelvin temperatures in Charles' law. If you think about that for a little bit, if we were to use Celsius values, all right, a couple weird things could happen. You could have a T1 or a T2 being zero Celsius, and dividing by zero is like one of the big faux pas of math. It freaks your calculator out if you try it. So you must use Kelvin temperatures for that reason. Um, you could also divide by negative numbers, because Celsius values that are negative are actually pretty common if you go below zero, the freezing point of water. Um, so you could have negative values and you're not going to have negative volumes and stuff like that. So um, when it comes to Charles' law, and actually when it comes to all calculations with temperature and pressure and, and gases, you must use Kelvin temperatures. You can record in Celsius in the lab and convert to Kelvin later, which is no problem at all, and then vice versa, convert back if you need to. But man, when you're using Charles' law and any of these gas laws, make Make sure you use Kelvin. There's lots of fun things, though, you can do with Charles' Law. This is a demonstration with liquid nitrogen, which is a super, super cold substance. And you can take a balloon, put it in the liquid nitrogen, and the gas inside the balloon literally shrinks down. So you can see that person pulled out there that green balloon. It was at one time inflated, but boy, then it gets, uh, then it gets deflated pretty fast. Now, if you let that super cold and shrunken balloon warm up to room temperature, it'll come back, all right? the gases come back, uh, which is really cool. And this is all Charles' law, all right? Temperature goes down, so the volume goes down. That's why you get this shrunken balloon. Then you let it warm up for a little bit. Temperature goes up, volume goes up. You're back to your regular balloon. 
So here's a question that you might see. All right, the volume of a gas is 235 milliliters at 25 degrees Celsius. At what temperature would the same gas have a volume of 310 milliliters? And assume for this problem that pressure and the amount, which is moles, are constant. Okay, so the big surprise, this is going to be a question about Charles' law. And Charles' law, and I'll put it up here in the upper left corner, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. And you can see here what we're looking for. We're looking for a new temperature. All right, what's the temperature when the new volume? So you need to basically solve for T2. Now, I want to do a little math here with you. We got to get T2 in the numerator on top. We can't leave it in the bottom. So first thing we need to do is multiply both sides by T2. So I'm going to multiply this side by T2. So the T2s cancel, and then you have, uh, I'll write it over here, V2 equals T2 V1 over T1. Now again, that's closer because now we've got T2 in the top, but we need to get T2 by itself, like T2 equals something, okay? So now what we're going to do to get T2 by itself, we're going to multiply both sides by T1 over V1. So I'm going to put T1 over V1 over here. Now the T1s will cancel, the V1s will cancel. So on the right hand side now, the only thing we have is T2. And T2 equals T1 times V2 divided by V1. So in a problem like this, this is the kind of thing you'd want to do to solve for T2. We're going to take T1 times V2 divided by V1. And when I am doing these problems, sometimes I'll go through and I'll actually like put a note next to which is which. So 235 milliliters, that's our V1. Milliliters are volume, all right? And 25 degrees Celsius is T1. Now, I can't leave it in Celsius. We talked about how you've always got to turn things into Kelvin, all right? So I can't leave this value in Celsius, but that is what T1 is. And then finally, the third piece here, 310 milliliters. 310 milliliters is V2. What we're going to have here, we're first going to convert Celsius to Kelvin, 25 degrees Celsius to Kelvin, and that'll be T1. We'll multiply it by V2, because remember, this is what we're doing up here on the top that I kind of created right here. We're going to multiply it by V2, 310 milliliters, and we'll then divide by 235 milliliters. T2 will come out in Kelvin, and you see that all of those values there are in Celsius. So finally, at the end, we're going to take our Kelvin and turn it back into Celsius, and hopefully it'll correspond to one of those numbers. Um, another thing before we start, we haven't done sig figs for a while. That little dot right there means that the 0 of 310 is a significant figure. All right, so 310 milliliters is 3 sig figs. If you didn't have that dot, then 310 milliliters would be only 2 sig figs. Dots are the ways to make the little 0 significant. So 25 degrees Celsius plus 273 is 298 Kelvin. And that T1 value will multiply by 310 milliliters V2. We'll divide it by 235 milliliters V1. And that's going to give us some number T2, which is a Kelvin temperature, the final temperature. And at the end, we've got to subtract 273 from that number to get it back into Celsius. Down on the bottom, here's kind of the punchline of all of this. So first of all, notice that I turned 25 degrees Celsius into Kelvin, 298. V2, 310, times 298 divided by 235 V1. That gives 393 Kelvin. And remember that all of the answers here are in Celsius. So 293 Kelvin minus 273 gets us 120 dot degrees. Celsius. 
Oh, yeah. So again, remember to always use Kelvin in these gas calculations. We're going to see that volume and pressure you can do some other things with. So like, for example, here, we didn't convert milliliters to liters. You absolutely could have. You could have used 0 0.310 liters and 0.235 liters, and that would be fine. But we really didn't need to. Milliliters will cancel out. The relationship between Kelvin and Celsius is adding, subtracting. Well, milliliters to liters is uh, multiplying, dividing. So that's kind of the math reason why we don't want to. Cool. Or don't need to. The third thing we're going to look at here, his name is Avogadro, and this is the Avogadro of Avogadro's number. Avogadro made his postulate about Avogadro's number using a study of gases. And again, he didn't actually figure out the number of Avogadro's number, but he came up with the idea that maybe it is. But anyway, in Avogadro's hypothesis, equal volumes of gas at the same temper and pressure have the same number of molecules. All right. And so you can mathematically say that volume equals some time of some type of constant k times the moles all right and the little picture down there i think does a better job notice that there's two balloons and let's assume that the balloon on the right is twice as big as the balloon on the left if that's the case then the balloon on the right has twice as many molecules as the balloon on the left volume literally is proportional to moles so if you double the moles, you double the volume. If you had a balloon that was three times as big, then you'd have three times as many moles, which of course means molecules as well. Mathematically, just like with the volume and temperature, you can write this as V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. All right. Now, you have to be careful with this law a little bit. You generally don't create or destroy matter. All right. That's not a good thing. So what people will use Avogadro's hypothesis for is thinking about doubling the amount of moles in a substance, like you add more gas in, and then the effect on the volume, stuff like that. You can't just change the volume and expect the moles to compensate, uh, that would be t tougher to do. Quantity and volume are directly related. If we take eight molecules of H2 and combine them with four molecules of O2, we get 12 molecules and a combined volume. If we then react the mixture, we end up with eight molecules of gaseous H2O, which occupies the same volume as eight molecules of any other gas. Remembering that the molecules are proportional to the moles, all right, if you wanted to take the eight molecules of H2 and turn it into moles, you would divide by Avogadro's number to find the moles. So all of those molecules are proportional to moles. So right away, look how the oxygen takes up less volume than the hydrogen. That's because you need twice the moles of hydrogen to react with oxygen. So the volume of hydrogen is twice that of the O2, just based based on the stoichiometry. Stoichiometry is the fancy name for the big numbers in front. The twos in front of the H2 and the water, those are stoichiometric factors. Volume is proportional to moles. So when the hydrogen molecules and the oxygen molecules initially were in the circle on the right side, on the product side, the circle was a lot bigger because you had three times the moles, etc. However, once they react, the two moles of water are proportional to the two moles or molecules of hydrogen. So you can see that their circles are kind of the same. So volume is proportional to moles. Um, in the lower right corner, it shows two tanks of helium. And the first tank, the balloon has one mole of helium. And the second tank, the balloon has two moles of helium. So the volume of the balloon is twice as big on the right as it is the left. Number of moles increases, the volume of the uh, gas increases. And then finally, on the upper right corner, that shows that balloons of helium, ammonia, and oxygen. And all of those are one mole quantities. So for helium, that would be be about four grams per mole. Look on the periodic table, helium is about four grams per mole. For ammonia, NH3, that would be about 17 grams per mole. A nitrogen is 14 grams per mole, plus three hydrogens, one gram per mole is 17 grams per mole. And finally, for O2, that would be about 32 grams per mole. O2 is one of the diatomics, so two times 16 is where the 32 comes from. The masses definitely are changing, but the number of molecules 
molecules are constant. They're all equal to one mole. And you'd feel a difference definitely between the three of them, but the volume would be the same because the moles are the same. A bicycle pump forces air into the confined space of the tire. As more air is added to the tire, the pressure increases. The tire's volume increases slightly, and the air becomes warmer. These observations are predictable properties of gases, and, as we explore in this chapter, they are described by the gas laws. This leads us into what's called the ideal gas law. And of all the equations in this chapter, the ideal gas law is the one I use the most. Um, I can actually derive Charles' law and Boyle's law and Avogadro's law from the ideal gas law. So this is a real handy kind of equation for, for me personally. And if you're going to do something like pump up a bike tire, which I have certainly have done before, um, the pressure is affected, the volume of the gas is affected. As you pump more quantity moles, which are N into it, and the temperature does change a little bit as well. And all of those things are related by that big R. And this big R is different than the R we saw in organic chemistry, which represented a generic alkyl group. This R is specific to gases. It's called the ideal gas law constant, or the gas law constant, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. But PV equals NRT super handy equation for this section. R, again, is called the gas constant, universal gas constant, different things like that. Um, depending on the kind of units you use, the actual value of R will change as well. Um, in this chapter, we're going to use the top value there of R a lot, 0.082057. That's, I call that the gas R because it's the one you use with gases. And and R equals PV over NT. You can see there that volume, liters, pressure, atmosphere is on top, moles, and Kelvin temperature on the bottom. So R equals PV over NT. It's a nice way to remember what uh, the ideal gas law equation is if you need it. Now, in later chapters, we're going to use the R that's just underneath it a lot. I'm going to call that the energy R. And 8.3145 joules per mole Kelvin is another version of R we're going to use quite a bit. In this chapter, it's all about 0 0.082057. But like I said, we're going to be using that 8.3145 number a lot in the future. Um, in physics, you'll talk about a way to turn liters atmospheres into joules. Liters atmospheres is actually a type of an energy, joules. And that's not so important for us right now, but in the future, you might see that. Just realize that there's a way to convert liters atmospheres into joules, turning 0 0.082057 into 8.3145. I highly recommend you memorize R. In this chapter, you will need 0 0.082057 a lot, and you don't want to have to keep looking it up or Googling it all the time, all right? And you might get confused and use other versions of R down there. Um, so make sure you know it. If you have room in your brain slash calculator, throw in the energy R as well, because in later chapters, that's going to dominate our discussions. This is a kind of problem where ideal gas law can be really useful. Let's say that we wanted to fill a small room with nitrogen gas, all right? And the small room is 960 cubic feet. So that would be feet cubed. <coughs> Excuse me. But that's a real ugly unit. So let's, uh, I converted it for you there. 960 cubic feet equals 2.70 times 10 to the fourth liters. And we want to fill the room up to a pressure of 740. 45 millimeters of mercury at 25 degrees Celsius. And again, the question is, how much nitrogen do we need? So how much nitrogen means moles, all right, because moles is a way to do that. We could convert moles into grams, kilograms, stuff like that, but moles is going to be our starting point. We will need the R value, so 0 0.082057, that's going to come in really handy here. So in a problem like this, what I would do, first get everything 
everything into the right kind of units. And if you look back at those values that are up there, the liters value is fine. All right, don't use the cubic feet like ever. Those are horrible units, but in my, my very biased uh, anti-imperialistic unit perspective. Um, but liters is great. Remember the R is liters, atmospheres per mole Kelvin. So liters and liters, no problem. But pressure, we're going to have to convert millimeters of mercury into atmospheres. And again, if you remember from earlier, that's 760 millimeters of mercury per atmosphere. So we'll do that. We're also going to need to convert uh, Celsius into Kelvin like we talked about earlier. And again, 273.15 added to 25 will give us the right kind of value. In this problem, here are the converted units. Volume again in liters, you don't have to change. You do have to change the temperature to Kelvin. You do have to change the pressure into an atmosphere. And so remembering that the 760 millimeters of mercury per atmosphere is considered an exact conversion, three sig figs and 745 millimeters of mercury creates a number that's three sig figs, 0 0.980 or 9.80 times 10 to the minus one, no problem. Also realize that when you add and subtract, sometimes you end up with more sig figs. When you add and subtract, it's always about the doubtful digit. 25 Celsius stops at the one spot, and that means our answer, 298, also has to stop at the one spot. But in the process, we went from two sig figs to three sig figs, and that's very, very normal. You could have also added 273.15, but because the answer stops at the one spot, you would cut off the 0 0.15, 298 Kelvin is the right answer here. So now that you've got everything in the right values and you know R, we can solve for N. N equals PV over RT. And we've got all the right kind of units that we need. So here's the values we calculated earlier. There's also the R value, 0 0.082057. And the moles comes out to be 1.08 times 10 to the third moles. All right. And if you're curious how that means, you can turn that into kilograms of nitrogen. It's about 30.3 kilograms. And how I got that number, I took the moles, I multiplied by the molar mass of N2, which is about 28 or so grams per mole, and then I converted grams to kilograms by dividing by a thousand. So this is the way to calculate how much N2 you need to fill up that small room. Here's another kind of problem you might see. This one involves stoichiometry. Now stoichiometry is just a way to convert one kind of unit into the other. And this was something we did in Chem 221. So in this problem, we've got some hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. And hydrogen peroxide is a liquid at room temperature. But in this problem, it's being converted into gaseous water and gaseous oxygen. So what we're going to do here, because we're looking, if you read through it, little bit. We're looking for the pressures of the gases, all right? We're going to have to convert the grams of liquid into moles. Use stoichiometry to go moles of the liquid to moles of one of the gases, and then finding the pressure from there, stuff like that. Remember that ideal gas law only works for gases, so we can't use PV equals NRT for H2O2 here because that's a liquid. PV equals NRT only works for gases, so it will work for water and oxygen, but not the hydrogen peroxide. So what we need to do here is turn grams of H2O2 into moles of H2O2. But first, this is actually a practical uh, problem. Uh, this bombardier beetle, and I don't know like anything about insects, I'll be honest. But anyway, apparently this beetle uses the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide to spray its enemies. And it sprays out pretty good because all these gases being created just, I'm sure, shoots out like a hydrant. Um, so that's kind of interesting in, unto itself. Anyway, what we want to do in this problem, we've got to figure out the moles of H2O2 first, then we'll use a 2 to 2 ratio to get to moles of water, or a 2 to 1 ratio to get moles of oxygen. And from there, we can solve for 
P pressure in the ideal gas law. P equals nRT over V. If we use all the right units, we're going to be good to go. We're going to do a lot of 25 degrees Celsius calculations. Room temperature is usually seen or felt to be 25 degrees Celsius, even if it's not quite right. And 25 Celsius is 298 Kelvin. So get ready. You're going to do a lot of 298 Kelvin temperature values if we're starting at 25 degrees Celsius. Grams to moles of the liquid, 1.1 gram per mole. H2O2, about 34 grams per mole. That 34 number comes from two hydrogens plus two oxygens. So on the periodic table, hydrogen is about one gram per mole. Oxygen is about 16 grams per mole. So two times one for hydrogen plus two times 16 for oxygen. That's where the 34 number came from. Two sig figs in 1.1 grams. So two sig figs in our moles, 0.032 moles hydrogen peroxide. Now we can convert it into oxygen or water. It doesn't really matter. Let's do oxygen first because I can show off a weird stoichiometry. All right, Stoichiometry is a way to convert, in this case, from reactants to products. The equation at the top there says that two moles of H2O2 that decompose will create one mole of oxygen. So that's where the one over two ratio came from. It's the two right here, and there's like an invisible one in front of the O2. That's what the one part came from. So 0.032 moles H2O2 should create 0.016 moles of oxygen. Finally, pressure of oxygen, like pressure of all gases, equals nRT over V. So we can use the 0 0.016 number for pressure of oxygen times R times, you guessed it, 298 Kelvin, 25 Celsius in Kelvin is 298, divided by the volume, 2.50 liters. And if you calculate that, 0.16 atmospheres. So the pressure of the oxygen gas in this example uh, from 1.1 grams of H2O2 will come out to be 0.16 atmospheres. We also want to calculate the pressure of the water. And what we could do is we could do the same kind of process we did earlier. We found moles of H2O2. You could convert that into moles of water. And it's 2 to 2 or 1 to 1. And from moles of water, you could plug that into P equals nRT over V to calculate the value. But there is a quicker way here. All right. We saw that by Avogadro's hypothesis that volume and moles are proportional. So as the moles went up, then the volume of the gas went up. So one mole had, let we'll say, one volume, two moles would have twice the volume. Well, you can do the same kind of thing for pressure. Uh, if the volume is constant, which it is in this problem, as the moles goes up, the pressure goes up. So you can also use Avogadro's hypothesis as a way to think about the pressure and mole changes. And why that's important here is that one oxygen is also going to be accompanied by two waters. It's a one to two ratio. So if the pressure of oxygen was given, which we just calculated on the last slide, the pressure of water should be twice as big because the mole ratio is twice as big. The pressure should also be twice as big. So if the pressure of the O2 on the last problem was 0.16 atmospheres, the pressure of water will be twice that number or 0.32 atmospheres. So you can use stoichiometry sometimes to calculate these pressures. And if you don't believe me, by all means, go back and figure out what the pressure of water would be based on the stoichiometry. So figure, go back to the moles of H2O2, which will equal the moles of water. P equals moles of water times RT over V. You should get 0.32. But of course, instead of doing that, using in stoichiometry a lot easier. Also notice that the total pressure of the flask would not would be 0.32 atmospheres plus 0.16 atmospheres. So you would have 0.48 atmospheres total. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. 
Dalton was the one that figured that the sum of the individual gases equals the total pressure in a gas. So if the water gas was 0.32 atmospheres, and that's what we looked at earlier, plus the pressure of the oxygen 0.16 atmospheres, the total pressure of all the gases will just be the sum of the individual ones, 0.48 atmospheres. This is called Dalton's law of partial pressures, and all it means is that you just add up the individual pressures to get the total pressure. In the lower um, picture right there, it shows three different gases at those three different pressures. A kilopascal is another type of pressure that can be measured. But if you mix all three of those together, then you'd have a total of 1,350 kilopascals, which is equal to 300 plus 600 plus 450. So Dalton's law of partial pressures just is adding up all the individual pressures to give the total pressure. And sometimes this can be helpful. So if you knew the total pressure was 0.48 atmospheres, and you knew you had 0.32 atmospheres of water, then you could find the oxygen by going 0.48 minus 0.32. That can be kind of handy sometimes in chemistry. So here's a question. Diborane reacts with oxygen to give boric acid, excuse me, boric oxide, which is B2O3, and water. And notice the stoichiometry there, 3O2, B2O3, 3H2O, etc. Et so here we're mixing B2H6 and O2 in the correct stoichiometric ratio. What that means is for every mole of B2H6, we have three moles of O2, okay? And the total pressure of the reactant mixture is 200 millimeters of mercury. So what that means is that the total pressure of the B2H6 and the 302s is 200 millimeters of mercury. Then it says what's the partial pressures of the reactant gases. Okay, at first this might seem a little bit weird, but remembering that the pressure of B2H6 plus the pressure of O2 equals 200 millimeters of mercury, we can actually figure this out, assuming that they're at that correct stoichiometric ratio. And if you go back to that ratio, it's one B2H6 for every three moles of oxygen. So if it's one to three, you can think about there as being like four equivalents of gases, all right? Because And of the four, one-fourth will be B2H6 and three-fourths will be O2. Now, 200 millimeters of mercury divided by four is 50 millimeters of mercury. And that literally is the pressure of one equivalent of gas. And B2H6 would be one equivalent, so that would be 50. 3 fourths uh, times 200 would give you the 150. So the answer here is going to be answer D. And again, how we did that is that the total moles on the reactant side essentially is four, all right? So 200 millimeters of mercury divided by four is 50. That's the pressure of the B2H6. And if these are at correct stoichiometric ratios, then one B2H6 needs three O2s, 50 times three, 150 millimeters of mercury for the O2. This is kind of an interesting uh, way to approach uh, these kind of problems, but it is kind of useful sometimes when you don't know the total pressure or you won't, you do know the total pressure, but you don't know the individuals. So I added up the total moles on the reactant side, one plus three, four, 200 divided by four gave me like one value. And that number times three gave the oxygen.